Hello, boys and girls. Welcome once again to Storytime. If you remember last week, we began the story, America's Lost Dream. We are going to continue that story today. Last week, we ended with Caesar Rodney casting the vote for independence. And then the Declaration of Independence was signed and sent to Great Britain. We will continue with that portion of the story. The American Revolution had ended in 1783 at the signing of the Treaty of Paris with Great Britain, but the quarrels with Britain would continue over the next 30 years. The iron fist of the British Empire was not about to allow these traitors to the king to live in peace for long. America was too great a prize to lose, and England would do whatever it took to regain control over her. But the Americans were determined to protect the dream. The superpower invaded the United States in two places, from the north out of Canada and on the Atlantic seaboard. Her ship sailed into Chesapeake Bay, and on August 24, 1814, the British attacked Washington. During the intense battle, the White House and the Capitol were destroyed. President Madison and his cabinet had to flee the city. Hope dwindled as the English forces advanced. America was once again coming under the power of the British crown. The last remaining American gunships valiantly charged the invaders, sinking at least two of its prized warships. Being smaller and faster than any in the British Armada, the gunship managed to evade enemy fire for most of the engagement. However, late that afternoon, with her ammunition gone, the lone ship was attacked by two of the larger enemy vessels and sunk. The entire crew was lost. The British fleet then moved up the Chesapeake Bay toward Baltimore, Maryland, the third largest city in America at that time. On September 12th, they arrived and found a thousand men at Fort McHenry, whose guns controlled the harbor. If the British wished to take Baltimore, they would have to first get past that fort. It was just another beautiful September day in the Sleepy Harbor town when the first British warship unexpectedly appeared on the horizon. England had successfully attacked Washington just a few weeks earlier and won. Now the War of 1812 was on Baltimore's doorstep, threatening to plummet the tiny country back under the rule of tyranny. The sight of a heavily armed English naval vessel quickly caused widespread alarm. Soon, the entire harbor was filled with them. However, this fight would be different than the one fought in the capital. The Americans had been preparing for this encounter. They were much better organized and fought more efficiently. However, five miles outside Baltimore, during their first engagement with the enemy of their freedom, the American forces were soundly defeated. It was a devastating blow. Morale was low and hope began to wane as victory now seemed beyond reach. America was too great a prize for England and they were determined to put these upstart colonists back in their proper place. The Brits advanced into the city ready to bring the war to a rapid conclusion. But the Americans were dug in and could not be coaxed from their defensive positions. Attacking their fortifications head on would result in heavy casualties. The British came up with an alternative plan. They would retreat and begin a naval bombardment on Fort McHenry. Do you see the ships in the water? The British ships coming to attack Fort McHenry. On one of the British ships was an aged physician, Dr. William Beans. A kind and compassionate healer, he had been treating any wounded soldier brought to him, British or American. While dressing the wound of an American in Maryland, he was arrested by Redcoats for aiding the enemy and was brought on board England's flagship as a prisoner. When he heard of the arrest, Francis Scott Key, a lawyer and friend of Dr. Beans, in an act of 
incredible bravery and loyalty, borrowed a small boat and rowed three miles out to the flagship to try and negotiate the good doctor's release. The British captain was willing, but Dr. Beans and Mr. Key would have to wait. It was the night of September 13th, and the bombardment of Fort McHenry had already begun. From the flagship anchored eight miles away, Key and Beans could see the American flag flying over Fort McHenry. Do you see the American flag flying over Fort McHenry? If you look very carefully, it's across the ocean there. And as twilight deepened, the night engulfed the flag. They knew the soldiers of the fort would resist down to the very last man. But the old and dilapidated fort was certainly no match for the formidable firepower of the British fleet. But as long as the flag flew, there was hope. The British possessed two new types of technology for warfare, the cannonball and the rocket. The first were fire rockets that were designed to explode into huge fireballs and burn down the wooden structures surrounding the fort. The second was a new kind of cannonball that contained a bomb inside the iron ball. The cannonball had a wick that would be lit and the shooting of it would be timed so that the bomb would explode as it landed. These two new weapons were ferocious and deadly. As the British began to unleash them, however, a storm materialized, seemingly out of nowhere, and a hard rain began to fall. The rain was dousing the fire rockets, putting them out before they landed. The wicks on the cannonballs contained too much gunpowder, a mistake at the factory, causing them to burn much more quickly. As a result, the bombs exploded prematurely in the air before landing on the fort. With each explosion above the fort, Key and Beans could see the flag still waving. The British ships attempted to move in closer but the artillery from within the fort did them too much damage, so they quickly retreated to a safer distance. That night, the rain and the thick smoke soon blocked out any view of the flag, and Key and Beans anxiously waited for the first light of dawn, hoping to see the flag. Do you see the flag? They must have asked each other many times, can you see the flag? When daylight began to displace the darkness, Francis Scott Key used a telescope to search the sky just above the fort. Suddenly it appeared, though tattered and torn, the flag flew in defiance of the grueling bombardment. The fr British fleet began retreating back up the Chesapeake. They had unleashed all their firepower throughout the night and were now completely out of ammunition. Excited about the news, Key used the only paper he had, a letter he was carrying, and began to compose a poem on the back of it about the rocket's red glare and the bombs bursting in air. Does that sound familiar? Think about it. What good are bombs that explode in the air before reaching their target? God had provided a storm with heavy rain that crippled the enemy's war machine and so turned the tide of the battle and the war. Key's four stanza poem was originally titled In Defense of Fort McHenry. It became popular by its nickname, The Star-Spangled Banner. And in 1931, Congress adopted it as our national anthem. Again, the dream had survived. A nation torn asunder. The dream of one nation under God faced its most formidable challenge, not from an outside enemy, but from one that grew within our own borders. 
We were well on our way to becoming a land of opportunity where the spirit of freedom would grow and expand along the American frontier. But there was a great unresolved conflict standing in the way of our progress. The agricultural economy and grand lifestyle enjoyed by those who owned the huge southern plantations was built and maintained on the backs of slaves. The very idea that a man can own another man or woman like he owned a horse or a steer became a great stumbling block of contradiction in the land of the free. Men and women were bought and sold like cattle on the open slave market and often subjected to cruel treatment at the hands of their masters. Attempts were made to put away slavery peacefully, but in the end, the conflict would not be averted by words, by deeds, by compromise, or by laws, although many good men and women attempted to settle it in those ways. Among them was a humble, plain-spoken citizen from Illinois, a self-taught lawyer running for the Senate named Abraham Lincoln. He asserted that the United States could not remain half free and half slave. Lincoln lost that election in 1858, but in losing, he won. The people could not forget this eloquent man who was the embodiment of the American dream. Two years later, they elected him president, but by then, the time for reasonable words had passed. He wrote, I know there is a God and that he hates slavery. I see the storm coming. I know his hand is in it. And so there came a great civil war, a war not prompted by an uprising amongst the slaves. They were virtually powerless to do anything to help their own situation. But the conscience of the country could not allow this terrible wrong to endure. We caused it. We allowed it. <coughs> we had to make it right. And so the Civil War was fought by one race of people to set another free. It was the deadliest war in our history, claiming the lives of more than 500,000 Americans. And when it was over, the nation had been preserved and the institution of slavery was gone forever. Near the end of his life, President Lincoln, who had often invoked the name of God publicly, was asked by a newspaper reporter if he was a Christian. Lincoln replied by saying, Sir, when I came to the Senate from the state of Illinois, I was not a Christian. And when I became president, still I was not a Christian. But when I walked the battlefields at Gettysburg, it was then that I cried out to the Savior for mercy and forgiveness and heard my cry, and he heard my cry, and I became a Christian. Though the war was now officially over, deep hatred and division still walked among us. Retaliation for the Union's victory over the South was found its highest revenge when John Wilkes Booth assassinated President Lincoln at the Ford Theater on the evening of April 14, 1865, while the president's wife looked on in horror. Though deeply wounded, the dream was still alive. Next week when we gather together, we're going to read about challenges in the new and modern world. Remember, we started this book in observation of Memorial Day, wanting to remember what those who have gone before us have done to secure our freedoms, our freedoms of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, our freedoms to learn about Jesus, to worship, to go to church, our freedom to do these things. And for that, we thank and honor God. Next week, we will complete the book, America's Lost Dream.